Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. We thank God for his grace and his mercy, yes. which has us where we are on this day. Let us put our hands together for our praise team and our band this morning. Amen. Amen. Share with us some old favorites in a new way. The scripture says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Amen. Amen. I want to take a moment to thank God for our media team who keeps all this running and connected. The guys and girls in the back keep, keep up the good work. That is wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. I thank God, of course, for our dear pastor, senior pastor, Jeffrey A. Dennis and his absence. Amen. 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 So, with that said, we are going to take a look at a passage of scripture. Um, one verse we're going to highlight as we talk about this topic for today from 1 Samuel chapter number 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. We're going to focus in on one verse, and that is verse 45 and 46. I'm sorry, yeah. Verse 45, sorry about that. Verse 45, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me or come against me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. That was 1 Samuel 17, verse number 45. I want you all to pray with us today as we talk about being fearless in a fearful age. Being fearless in a fearful age. Let us pray. Our great God and Father, in the mighty, majestic name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ the righteous, King of kings and Lord of lords, Mary's child, God's one and only Son. For unto us a son is born, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In that mighty name and for your sake, Lord, we pray. Amen and amen. Feel free to take your seats. Being fearless in a fearful age. Being fearful in a fearful age. I'm going to ask at this time, just in case you haven't already, if you have a cell phone or bu buzzing, beeping device, please take this time to put it on silent or turn it off. Amen. 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 All right. Minister Ray, Minister Jennifer, and Deacon Rob and myself, we have the opportunity on a weekly basis to go into Akron public school classrooms all over the city, promoting mental health for students of all ages as the prevention team of the Minority Behavioral Health Group. Under, of course, the leadership of Senior Pastor Jeffrey Dennis and our very own U University of Akron professor, Dr. John Queener. The prevention team works with various students who are sometimes easy to work with and sometimes not so easy to work with. However, one notable example comes to mind, that of a fourth grader a couple of months ago. We were in the midst of a discussion about mental health during the ongoing war in the Ukraine. Parenthetically speaking, I'll put this in parentheses, so to speak, you'd be amazed family at how much our youth are interested in politics and world events when you sit down and take the time to talk to them. So we're in the middle of some lively discussion about what's going on in the world. And students brought up the possible threat of another world war. We were busy encouraging the students when another child got my attention and pointed in the corner of the classroom near the back. I went over and I noticed a young man curled up in the corner sobbing. I asked him what was going on 
and he said through his tears, I don't want to be separated from my mom. I don't want to die, he said. We consoled him and strengthened him to not worry about such things, and by the end of our conversation, not only was he no longer crying, but he had a resolve and interest to serve in the U.S. military to protect his mother and others of our country from tyrants like Russia's Vladimir Putin. He went from fearful to fighter. From fearful to fighter. The point of this little story is that this fourth grader is not alone. Many of us are concerned or just plain scared of the U.S. entering to another war, this time against Russia. I can remember when I was in middle school back in the 1980s during the Cold War. I had a constant fear that we would go to war with Russia. Here we are in 2022. And that fear has raised its ugly head again in the hearts and minds of men, women, boys, and girls all over the country. The Lord Jesus' words about wars and rumors of wars is being fulfilled in our world right now. But we don't have to fear. We can be fearless in a fearful age. Like the little shepherd boy in our text, David, we will fear no evil. Jesus was the son of David, a descendant of David, the hope of Israel, and the boldness for a shepherd boy. Jesus' blood makes us fearless, just like David was against Goliath. I believe a good definition of fear is imagination taken hostage. Imagination taken hostage. I can only imagine what the enemy tried to put in the heart of little young David, the shepherd boy, when he saw Goliath with his spear and sword and javelin and shield and everything he came against him with. But fear would try to take our imagination hostage. It takes our imagination and tortures us with the bad things we could imagine that might possibly happen. I'm reminded of a movie called Taken, starring Liam Neeson. Some of you all have seen that movie. He was a spy whose daughter was abducted on a European vacation. And Neeson's character went to great lengths to rescue his daughter from the grip of her enemies. He also kicked some European butt in the progress, in the process of liberating his baby girl. If this father was concerned about his daughter who was captured, how much more do you think our Father in heaven is concerned about us when fear takes our imagination hostage? If Liam Neeson's character from the movie did great things to rescue his daughter, imagine for a moment what the Lord is willing to do to save us, his children, because the Lord is our shepherd and we can be fearless. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. I'm fearless. Speaking of shepherd, that takes us to the text of a fearless shepherd boy named David. David had experienced shepherding sheep. He had experienced shepherding the sheep over there in the Middle Eastern area. One day, David must have thought to himself about how he and what he does for his sheep. And the Lord does for him. I'll say that again. David must have realized what he does for sheep, the Lord does for him. He led the sheep as the Lord led David. He fed the sheep as the Lord fed him. He protected the sheep as the Lord protected him. He must have thought, hey, wait a minute. Just like the Lord, just like I shepherd these sheep, the Lord shepherds me. So the Lord is my shepherd. And so begins one of the most popular psalms in the Holy Bible, Psalm 23, also known as the shepherd psalm. Young David has extensive experience protecting the sheep, and he even delivered them from the mouths of a bear and a lion before. So he had a certain boldness in the face of Goliath. Somebody say boldness. 
a certain boldness in the face of Goliath and the boasting that Goliath was doing against God and his people. Many of us are familiar with the story here in 1 Samuel 17. Goliath makes great boasts. Israel gets scared. Saul and the army were shaken in their sandals. David volunteers with three smooth stones. Goliath makes fun of David. David challenges Goliath. They go to battle, and David strikes him in the head with a, with a smooth stone and kills Goliath. That's the story many of us, if not all of us, are familiar with. David told Goliath, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David says, you're trying to defy the God of Israel, the king of all creation, and you have your sword, you have your spear, you have your javelin, but I got the name of the Lord on my side. Somebody say, I got the name of the Lord on my side. David had a boldness and fearlessness about him that we're going to need in this day and age in which we live. The Lord Jesus taught his disciples about the last days, and right now we are living those days as the Bible teaches us about how there'll be wars and rumors of wars that's going on right now. He also said that the hearts of men will grow cold. How else can you explain a young man slaughtering 10-year-olds at Uvalde, Texas classrooms last month? How else can you explain a white supremacist murdering black people in a grocery store in Buffalo last month? These are all examples of the hearts of men growing cold, just as Jesus said would happen. So not only is there a war in Ukraine, but people are still dying of COVID, and there has been at least 230 mass shootings this year alone in our country. Of course, a mass shooting is defined as four or more people being shot or killed in an incident. There's been at least 230, 230 of those in our country. That's more than one a day so far for the year. Yes, we all have a lot to be afraid of and numerous reasons to cry like the little boy in my classroom, as I mentioned earlier, but we, like young David, can be fearless in a fearful age. Here are some brief affirmations, if you will, some positive personal statements that may shape our attitudes that can help us when fear tries to take our imaginations hostage. When the enemy wants to capture your mind, we can remind ourselves of these simple truths. Number one, from Isaiah 41.10, I get from that. The, 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 the prophet Isaiah wrote these words. He said, the Lord said, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yea, I will help you, yea, I will uphold you with my righteous, my victorious right hand. The prophet Isaiah said, don't be afraid because God is with us. The simple affirmation I get from that text is I will not insult my God by being afraid of you. I will not insult my God by being afraid of you. That was the heart that King young, young David, before he became king, that was his heart, his heart and mindset. I'm not going to be, I don't care you six, nine, nine, six. I don't care how tall you are. I'm not going to allow you to intimidate me and cause me to insult my God by being afraid of you. And some of us need to speak that to the situations and circumstances of our lives. Some of us are afraid of Monday because when Monday comes, we have to go back to work and we got to deal with those people. And we have to deal with those customers, those employees, those supervisors, or whoever it is that we're not looking forward to seeing on tomorrow. So many of us, we look at the news and we see what's going on in our world, our country, even in this city. A young man was just um, killed near the I Promise School just this past weekend. 
and we look at what's going on and we're tempted to be afraid. We're tempted to get scared. But we don't have to fear. Why? Because God said, I am with you. Do not be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will not insult my God by being afraid of you. Galatians chapter 2 says, Dick and Johnny, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is telling us that we have been crucified with Christ. So the simple affirmation I get from that is I will not fear death because I'm already crucified with Christ. I will not fear death because I'm already crucified with Christ. Colossians 3 says, since then we have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Paul is telling his readers, the church at Colossae, the church at Mount Calvary, the church on Bell Street, you have died. That is a strange utterance to tell someone or to talk about because we all are living, yet Paul said we're dead. You see, we don't have to fear death because we're already dead. What does that mean? We're dead to sin and alive in Christ. So we don't have to fear death because remember the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if the wages, amen, put your hands together. If, get this. If the wages of sin is death, but I am now dead to sin. There's nothing left but life and life everlasting in Christ Jesus. We don't have to. Don't have to fear death because we're already crucified with Christ. Third affirmation. I will not fear wars and rumors of wars because the Lord is my light and my salvation. Some of y'all know this scripture from Psalm 27. So David writes this, he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, in this will I be confident. David said, though war should break out against me. I'm still going to be confident in the God of my salvation. Whether that's World War I, World War II, World War III, World War IV, World War V, whatever war comes against me, I'm confident in God saving me. I'm reminded my kids showed me a video of something that really um, amazed me on the internet during the, the beginning of the war in Ukraine. There was a video circulating on the internet, and I didn't, th I didn't think it was so unbelievable, Deacon. I didn't think it was real. But it was a video of a, a person driving their car down the street in Ukraine, and one of Russia's tanks just rolled up over the car while the man was driving. Now, that was a horrible scene. All over internet and YouTube, everywhere, everybody's able to see this. But the encouraging word I got from that horrible scene is that the man in the car, he lived. Right. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. There are, in Ukraine right now, from what I understand based on the news report, there are um, nannies, if you will, taking care of, uh, of infants. And they're in bunkers underneath the city. They're trying to take care of these babies that have been separated from their parents. And there's bombs going on outside, 
and they're trying to take care of the kids on the inside. And Brother Kaiser, the, the, the news report said these women, it's only about maybe three to five of them taking care of 20-something kids. They sleep for 45 minutes a day. God will give you the strength to do what God has called you to do. If those women can sleep 45 minutes a day and take care of a bunch of infants, surely, somebody say surely, surely we can have the strength to do the things he's called us to do. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? So the first affirmation we said was, I will not insult my God by being afraid of you. The second one is, I will not fear death because I'm already crucified with Christ. The third one, I will not fear wars and rumors of wars because the Lord is my light and my salvation. God gave me light and he saves me. He gave me the light of life. He birthed me into the world, and he's birthed me again into salvation. So I believe I'm going to be all right. Somebody say, you're going to be all right. The next affirmation as we prepare to come to a close this morning, the next affirmation comes from Hebrews 13. Um, I'm sorry, 1 John 4. 1 John chapter 4. He wrote in this little book toward the end of the Bible, and we know and have believed or rely on the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who live in God lives and loves in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may be boldness in the day of judgment. Somebody say boldness. We may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Remember at the beginning, we talked about how fear is imagination taken captive, imagination taken captive. And when the enemy takes our imagination, he uses torment to try to get us to think about all the horrible things that might happen to us. But the Bible says fear has to do with torment, but perfect love, somebody say perfect love. Perfect love casts out fear. The affirmation from that simply says, I will not fear because God loves me. I mean, you can just, just put a pen right there. I will not fear because God loves me. And his perfect love casts out fear. Just like Jesus cast out de demons, his perfect love casts out fear. God loves me. He's on my side. I'm on his side. He's in me. I'm in him. So I'm going to be all right no matter come what may. Whatever happens in this big old world, God has a way of preserving his people. Amen? Amen. And then we move down to our fifth affirmation, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number five. Paul, the writer of Hebrews, says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, somebody say boldly. boldly. We may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Then he asked a real rhetorical question at the end. What can man do to me? Think about that for a second. He says, the Lord said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Bible says that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And before that verse, it, you do well if you haven't read it before. The verse that's that right before that, the verse right before that says that God created the blacksmith who makes the metal and the iron for the weapon. Yeah. So God created the one who makes the weapons. So no weapon that they form against you yeah. shall prosper yeah. because God made the person who made the weapon. Yeah. Therefore, no weapon 
They form against you. No imagination, no thing they come up with shall prosper against God's people. Upon this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We have no need to fear and we can boldly say like the writer of Hebrews, what can man do to me? What you going to do? I'm already crucified with Christ. What you going to do? I'm not going to insult my God by being afraid of you. What you going to do? Wars and rumors of wars come against me, but I'm not going to be afraid. What you going to do to me? We have a boldness based on the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we're going to be all right. We close out simply with a verse that many of you all have already memorized. Romans chapter 8, verse number 38. We talk about being fearless in a, fear, in a fearful age. Romans chapter 8, verse 38. Listen to Paul. For I am persuaded, convinced, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor demons, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves me, so I'm going to be okay. If that young man was in church today, I could tell him what we just talked about. In, in school, we can't really talk about um, religion as much in church. I mean, in school. But if he was here today, I'd tell him, because God loves us, because God loved you, you're going to be okay. I don't know what's going to happen in this big old world where we live at, but I do know who holds tomorrow. And his name is Jesus. The lily of the valley. The rose of Sharon. The bright and morning star. He is Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end. He is Jesus, our Christ, our closest super friend. That's who he is to us. And he tells us in the book of Acts chapter 4 that for those that don't know the Lord right now, the Bible says plainly, and I know there's a lot of different religions out there and philosophies and a lot of things you can read on the internet and YouTube and Instagram and so on. There's a lot of information out there about life and faith and eternity. But the Bible is plain in Acts 4. It says that salvation comes by none other. For there is no other name under heaven given among us for salvation but Jesus Christ. That's the only name. I know there's so many people that have so many different views of who God is or who Jesus is. They say that Jesus was a great prophet. But there's something wrong with that statement because normal people don't say the stuff that Jesus said. Jesus said, tear down this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Bible says he was talking about his body. Normal people don't say, kill me and I'm going to raise myself up again. You can't just be a good prophet and do that. In the words of C.S. Lewis, you got to either be a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord of glory. There are no other options. Jesus is a bold-faced liar. He's a stark raven lunatic. Or he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. The merciful God ruling, reigning, supreme over each and everything. That's our God. That's who he is. And if you don't know him today, if you're under the sound of our voice on this morning, and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we invite you into the kingdom of God on this day. Wherever you are, whether you're here in church at 442 Bell Street with us today, whether you're online in some way to witness our service on YouTube or Facebook Live, we welcome you. We usher you into the kingdom, not just the church here at Mount Calvary, but the church universal. We want you to be a part of this thing that Jesus said he will build 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, it's a really simple instruction, not a whole lot involved on this thing. It's, the Bible teaches us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's it. Confession and belief. Your confession says, Lord, you're, you're the Lord. Jesus, you're Lord. I'm not Lord. I, I'm not good at trying to be the God of my own life. It doesn't really work well for me. And Lord, I believe that you died to pay for all of my sins. But I also believe according to your word that you rose from the grave with all power in your hands. If that's you and you want this Christ, this Jesus we call the Christ, if you're here, Slip your hand up wherever you are. Amen. Amen. We want to welcome you. If you're online, make sure you let somebody know that you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And then give us a call. Give us a holler right here at Mount Calvary through the telephone or email or online, whatever way. Let us know that you made the most important decision you will ever make in your life. Now, there might be someone else amongst us who says, you know what, I, I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose for me. I believe he has a place set aside for me in his kingdom. But right now, I'm scared. When I look at all that's going on, as a matter of fact, I don't even want to look at the news. I don't even want to listen to what's going on because it's so discouraging. And some of us are tempted to be scared, fearful, apprehensive, and anxious. If that's you and you're going through on this day, Feel free to meet us at the altar. We'll pray with you. Those online will pray with you through this connection that God gives us the power, the boldness, and the strength to be fearless in a fearful age. So if that's you and you want prayer on this morning, those in the house today, feel free to join us at the altar. Those at home or on the internet, Please join us where you are. Amen. Amen. We are going to pray right before we do Holy Communion. So let us turn our hearts and minds toward heaven and have a little talk with Jesus. Our great God and Father, in the mighty, majestic name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ the righteous. Thank you, Lord, for this day that you have made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. Lord God, we put our fears at your feet, recognizing today that you're too big for us to be scared of anything else. And you're too loving for us to allow the enemy to take our imagination hostage. According to your word, you love us with a love that goes beyond all understanding. What manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. And that is who we are all because of what your son, our Savior, did on Calvary's cross. In the mighty name of the one who died, was buried, but rose again, Lord, give us a fearless spirit. Give us boldness in this fearful time in which we live so that we may face our enemies just like David faced Goliath and come out victorious. In the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. 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 Put your hands together for our great God. He is worthy to be praised. We're going to prepare for communion. 
But right before I do that, I just want to remind you that right now, this time of year, the NBA has what they call the NBA Finals. And that name is a misnomer because next year they're going to have the finals again. And next year they have the finals again. But imagine, if you will, as we prepare to go into communion, imagine, if you will, wasn't it 2016 Cleveland won the finals, right? Imagine if the 2016 finals was really the final. There were no more basketball games after 2016. And Cleveland won the last game. Every now and then, we would all come together just to remember how Cleveland whooped up on the opposing team, hopefully the Warriors. And we come together on a regular basis to remember how Cleveland won the last final. That is what we do with communion because Jesus won the finals. Thank you.